So I actually decided to change my talk a little bit from what I originally proposed. And I decided to do so in the context of this environment, to think about what we're doing in terms of big data. And so I'm going to talk about privacy and publicity, but I'm going to do it in light of big data. Now, unless you've been hiding under a rock, you've had a hard time missing the fact that we're currently having conversations over and over again about privacy. And we're talking about it from different angles. As somebody who studies teenagers, I usually hear it in the form of a moral panic. Oh my god, what are teenagers doing? The world is ending. Right? At the same time, we're hearing it in communities like this, where we're hearing about questions of data retention, identity theft, phishing, security questions, government transparency, etc. So what we hear is that privacy keeps coming up in all of these different waves, and we keep talking back and forth and away from one another. Privacy concerns are not new. We've been obsessed with privacy for a very long time, um, long before the internet even. But what is new has to do with big data. Now, while databases have been chomping away and aggregating data for over a century, the internet has created unprecedented opportunities for people to produce and participate in the production of data in interesting ways. They remix data, they aggregate data, they organize data. Average people are participating in data. Data has become the digital air that we're swirling around. And when we talk about privacy and publicity, we can't avoid talking about data. We can't avoid talking about how data is produced, stored, shared, consumed, aggregated, etc. Now for the purpose of this talk, when I talk about big data, I'm specifically referring to the social data that marketers and researchers and business folks are currently salivating over. Data about people, their activities, their interactions, their behaviors. Data that sits at the foundation of Facebook, Twitter, and all of the crazy social media that we're paying attention to. It's also the center of amazing conversations here at DubDubDub, and that's why I'm honored to speak here. Many of you are in the business of mucking around with data. Some of you are building tools, but all of you are producing it or aggregating it or playing with it in some way. Now, we've entered an era where data is cheap, but making sense of it is not. Many of you are sitting on terabytes of data about human interactions, and the opportunity to scrape data or more politely use APIs to access data legitimately um, have become unprecedented. And as folks are buzzing around wondering what they can do with all of these data that they can get their hands on, I feel like a few important questions have dropped out. We need to ask what it means to engage with this data. We need to think about a whole set of ethics and methodological questions, and we need to think about what privacy and publicity means in this context. Now, in order to get to privacy, I want to sort of think about methodology, because the two are tightly intertwined. And I'm going to do it for a couple of reasons. First, DubDubDub is one of the most important places where we're seeing big data being uh, researched. And at the same time, I don't think that we have the same long-standing methodological questions that we see in the social sciences. And so I think it's important to have a methodology conversation here that talks about big data in light of privacy and ethics. I also think it's a really important frame methodologically to think about how we get to privacy. At this point, I'm an ethnographer. What that means at the coarsest of levels is I try to map cultures. I try to make sense of what people do. And as, as Dame Wendy pointed out, I didn't start here. I started out in computer science. I started out visualizing social networks. I was obsessed with big data. I thought it was really, really interesting. But I started realizing that the data that I was visualizing taught, introduced more questions than answered. And I really wanted to understand why. And I started doing a lot of field work, qualitative field work, in order to get to those why questions. And in the process, I started thinking about what we were doing with big data and how the two intertwined. And so I want to talk about that intersection because I think it's important. In a recent essay on big data, Scott Golder began by quoting George Homes, Homan's a famous sociology. The methods of social science are dear in time and money and getting dearer every day. And social scientists have long been complaining about access to data as one of their core problems. And historically speaking, collecting data was hard, time consuming, resource intensive. And much of the enthusiasm that surrounds big data is the fact that it's so easy to access data. Or in Vint Cerf's words, we've never in the, ever in the history of mankind have had access to so much information so quickly and so easily. Unfortunately, what gets lost in this excitement is a lot of critical analyses about what this data is. Many of you in the room are approaching big data from a computational perspective, but there's a lot to be learned from what social scientists have been thinking and how they actually deal uh, with methodology and how they think about data. Social scientists have long been in the business of collecting, aggregating, and analyzing social data, but their analyses are very much about methodology. 
So I want to bring, uh, I want to start out by four key issues that are really coming from the social sciences that I think are really critical for talking about here. One, bigger data are not always better data. Two, not all data are created equal. Three, what and why are different questions. And four, be careful of your interpretations. So big data is super exciting, um, but quality matters more than quantity. And to know the quality of your data, you must know something about the limits of your data. One of the most important methodological challenges in the social sciences is to understand sampling. And this is relevant to all fields of social science, including ethnography. How you sample your data affects what claims you can make. You need to know the, ex the sample in order to extrapolate arguments about what the data says. If you want to make claims about representativeness, you need to actually think about the ultimate sample, which is a random one. If you're trying to make topological claims, you're trying to sample for diversity, not representativeness in the same way. And thinking about these becomes really critical. In a methodological utopia, you want to have access to the whole population so that you can make wise decisions about how to sample. Given a whole data set, a scholar with questions about frequency would be able to easily acquire a representative random sample. And given a whole data set, a scholar with questions about diversity would be able to account for outliers. Historically, we understand that it was extremely hard to get access to anything resembling a whole network. So a whole set of methodological questions came about about how to sample. Big data introduces the possibility of the whole data sets, but doesn't necessarily guarantee whole data sets. Twitter has all of Twitter, but the problem is that most researchers who research Twitter do not have all of Twitter. At best, you have the public tweets, but more likely, you have the stream of public tweets from the public timeline. These tweets aren't even random. In too many articles I've been reviewing, people argue that their sample is valid because they have millions of tweets without accounting for what those tweets are and what they represent. Bigness and wholeness are not the same. If you're trying to understand the topical frequency of tweets and Twitter removes all the tweets that contain problematic words, your analysis will be wrong regardless of how large your sample is. Sampling also requires working out biases. Are certain types of people more likely to be over or underrepresented? If so, what does that mean? Now let's assume that you have, for a moment, every public, pub, public tweet ever sent on Twitter. If you randomly sample those, you do not have a random sample of users. You have a random sample of public tweets. This is simple. Not all t accounts tweet at the same frequency. So random sa randomly sampling tweets over samples accounts that produce more tweets. Furthermore, if you can actually, actually account for all Twitter accounts you, um, and you randomly sample across those, you're not randomly sampling Twitter users. Some users have multiple accounts. Others don't even have accounts, but they consume it actively. Others are participating in un unexpected ways. You need to know something about your data set, how it actually comes into being. If you're seeing millions and millions of pieces of data, it doesn't mean your data is random, and it doesn't mean it's representative. To make claims about your data, you need to know where the data comes from. This brings us to the second key issue. Not all data are created equal. Because of the bigness of big data, many who work with it believe that it's the best data out there. Now, I'm astonished by the number of people who think that big data will render all other approaches to data collection useless, because I keep hearing that big data is pure data. Big data has its limitations. It can only reveal certain things, and it's really dangerous to assume that it does more than it can. This co keeps coming up in relation to social networks, one of my favorite topics. People from diverse disciplines who are analyzing social networks using diverse methodologies are constantly battling about uh, what that means. But it kills me when those who are working with big data sets um, think that the data that they've, they've collected from Facebook or through cell phone records are more accurate than all other forms of data collected about social networks. Part of the challenge is that we're actually often talking about different kinds of social networks. Historically, uh, sociologists who were doing surveys and interviews, observations and experiments, build a whole set of theories around what they talk about as personal networks. And they think about what that means. Big data introduces two different kinds of social networks that are equally interesting, but not the same. The first is articulated social networks. These are the people that you list off on your Facebook or other spaces. These are the people who you've accounted for in a very specific, formalized way. And at the same time, we've also gotten into behavioral social networks. These are the people who you might be in the same room with, people who you communicate with via email, via IM, via cell phone records. Each of these are extremely important and very interesting data sets, but they're not the same as personal data sets, personal networks. 
you need to realize some of the complexities of why these data sets are different. So for example, when we think about articulated networks, you have to realize that those who put people in the con their contacts lists aren't necessarily doing this because they're their closest friends. There are all sorts of political reasons to add somebody, and anybody who's been on Facebook has seen this, right? Having to add your, your boss, your colleague, somebody you don't really like um, is pretty common at this point. There's also people that you would like to add that you don't add because they're not on Facebook. And you also have to realize that when people communicate with other people, it's not necessarily because they're the closest and dearest friends. Um, and so you have to think about what this means and how, how this works out. You can't analyze Facebook friends list and say that you've analyzed a person's personal social network. You have it. You analyze their Facebook friends list. Now, it's a good idea to think about where some of the theories applies, right? So personal networks have had a whole set of theories that have come out. And some of them are extremely relevant. Right, homophily has been shown to apply to all three of these networks in really interesting ways. But you, when you assume that something that you see in behavioral networks or in articulated networks um, is playing out the way it is, don't assume that means that personal networks are wrong. Nowhere have I been seeing this more than the questions of tie strength. Right? Now, the person that I list as my top friend on Facebook or MySpace may not be my best friend. I may have listed that person for all sorts of political reasons and, and drama and not wanting to deal with it. That becomes very important. But it's even more clear around behavioral uh, networks. I'm amazed at the idea that we have to, that we assume that just because somebody talks to somebody else frequently, they're close friends. I can guarantee you I talk to my collaborators much more frequently than my mother. But I would never ever say that my, my mother is less important to me than my collaborators. Part of it is that what social, sociologists have been studying for a long time are people's mental models of their tie strength, how they weight things, not the things that you can actually weight on a graph. In this vein, remember that data is not generic. It doesn't say generic things just because you can model it, graph it, or compute it. You need to understand the meanings behind the representation. You need to understand what the edges mean. Not all data is equivalent, even if it can be represented in ways that look equivalent. On that note, we have to talk about the why, the questions about what, and questions about why are fundamentally different. Now, I think this is best seen through the world of marketers. Nobody loves big data better than marketers. And nobody misinterprets big data better than marketers. My favorite moment came when I was on a panel. A brand marketer was proudly announcing, a brand marketer from Coca-Cola was proudly announcing that they had embraced MySpace and they had acquired some extremely large number of friends on MySpace. And they were really excited about this. I was on this panel and I couldn't stop but bursting out laughing. And the reason why is I had started noticing with my teenagers that a lot of them had been connecting to Coke. So I started poking around to ask why. Um, I started asking why they were participating. And after a few, talking to a few people, I found the answer. Those who were linking to Coca-Cola were making an identity statement, but it wasn't that Coke that they were referring to. <laughs> this did not go over well, by the way, with Coca-Cola. And they were quite embarrassed by this and stopped proudly announcing the fact that they were being used. So analyzing traces of people's behavior and interactions is extremely important in research. But you also have to understand the extent to which you can actually ask questions you're meaning to get at. If you look at frequencies, if you look at what you can compute, you can get to the what. But what and why are different questions. If you want to work with big data, you need to know the limits of your question and know when you actually have to collaborate with other people to actually make those connections to get into this. You can't motivate your analysis based on whatever you'd like and then assume that you've answered the why questions just because you could model it. This becomes a really big problem in the worlds of big data. Now, it's not just researchers who keep messing this up. I'm completely entertained by the ways in which average people actually assume that what and why are the same thing, especially when it comes to making information available. Back in the day, there was a, a cute little software agent called Cobot who used to roam Lambda Mu. And it collected all sorts of data about the people who were participating there. And eventually, the participants in Lambda Moon were upset. They were like, well, if this robot is going to be here, the robot should give back. The pro programmers went, OK, we can make the little robot give back. So they programmed Cobot to be able to answer questions about the data that it collected. Needless to say, the first thing that people asked was, who do I talk to the most, fr most frequently? And somebody would write back, Bob. Ah, well, then who does Bob talk to the most frequently? Alice. Hmm, I don't like Bob anymore. And all of a sudden, people misinterpreted the fact that they had frequency to assume that they were, it was about high strength and importance. And Lambda Mu turned into a complete field of drama, right, about all of these questions about who is most important. We keep seeing drama come back over and over again about these misinterpretations.
Keep in mind that every act of data analysis, whether it is by you as researchers or by people who are participating in these environments, regardless of how big or mathematical your data set is, requires interpretation. There's a mistaken assumption that qualitative research is about interpretation and quantitative research is about producing facts. As computational scientists have started engaging in this world, they've started seeing it as a quantitative activity where they are the fact givers. And you can build a model that is mathematically sound. You can produce a, a, an experiment that is perfectly uh, methodologically sound. But the process of understanding what it means is a, is a task of interpretation. And interpretation always has biases. It always has accountabilities. And going through that process, learning how to keep those biases in check becomes absolutely critical. Misinterpretations are beautifully displayed when people try to implement technology. And I love this. I love watching social science get completely corrupted by technology creators. Nowhere was this more beautiful than when Friendster back in the day decided to interpret Robin, Robin Dunbar's work. Analyzing gossip practices in humans and grooming practices in monkeys, Dunbar found that the maximum of, of a person's personal network at any point in their life was 150. In other words, you could only keep up with the gossip of 150 people at max at any time. Friendster interpreted this to say that people would only have a maximum of 150 friends, ever. Regardless of the articulated nature of this, regardless of all of the temporal nature of this, and they capped the number of people you could be friends with. Needless to say, people blew over this, we've seen this over and over again. Even all of, all of you probably have more than 150 friends now on social network sites. It's not because Dunbar was wrong, it was because he was trying to measure something differently and it was misinterpreted. Interpretation is the hardest part of doing data analysis, the hardest part of implementing uh, social science. No matter how big your data set is, you need to understand the limits of it, your, un your own biases, and how you might misinterpret it. This is why social scientists are obsessed with methodology. So if you want to understand big data, you need to start by understanding the methodological processes. Connected to methodology are questions of ethics, and here's where privacy and publicity come into play. The number one destabilizer of privacy today comes from our collective societal obsession with big data. The biases and misinterpretations that are present in the analysis and use of big data are fundamentally affecting people's lives. The uncertainty principle doesn't just apply to physics. The more you try to formalize and model social interactions, the more you disturb the balances of them. Our collective tendency to treat people or treat social data as abstractable entities rather than soil and green puts people at risk. If you don't understand what the data is or where it comes from, how you use it can be deeply problematic. And what you, when you implement features or misinterpretations, you can hurt people. Helen Nissenbaum has long reminded us that privacy is about context. So is the interpretation of big data. Methodology is about working through those contexts and what data you're, you're collecting and aggregating and analyzing. It's about making a best guess about your presence and how your analysis will affect the people. This is why we have to talk about ethics and why we have to talk about privacy. So this leads us to the biggest thing to sort of keep in mind. Just because data is accessible doesn't mean that using it is ethical. It terrifies me how often I hear those obsessed with big data espouse their right to collect, aggregate, analyze anything they can get their hands on. In short, if it's accessible, it's fair game. And to get here, we've perverted the notion of public to mean accessible by anyone, under any condition, at any time, for any purpose. We've stripped content out of context, labeled it as data, and justified our actions by the fact that we have access to it in the first place. Now, alarm bells should be ringing, because these cavalier attitudes around uh, privacy are really important to think about. What's at stake is not whether or not something is possible, but what the unintended consequences of our actions are. And this is why ethics matter. Privacy isn't about control over data, or it's not a property of data. It's about a collective understanding of a social situation's boundaries and knowing how to operate within them. In other words, it's about having control over a situation, a social situation. It's about understanding your audience, knowing how information will flow. It's about trusting people, the situation, the context. People seek privacy so they can make themselves vulnerable in order to gain something personal. They want support, they want knowledge, they want friendship, they want connection. People feel as though their privacy has been violated when their expectations are shattered. This classically happens when somebody shares something that wasn't meant to be shared. And this is why trust comes into play whenever we talk about privacy. People trust each other to maintain the collectively understood context and to operate within that. And they feel violated when they're not. Understanding the context isn't just about understanding the audience. It's also about understanding the environment, the physical environment, the digital environment. 
Just as people trust each other, they also trust the setting in order to make their assessments. And they blame the architecture when they feel as though they've been duped. Consider the phrase, these walls have ears, which dates back to at least Chaucer. The phrase highlights how people blame architecture when it obscures their ability to properly interact in a context. Consider this in the light of grumblings about Facebook's uh, issues around privacy. The core privacy challenge is that people believe they understand the context in which they're operating. And they get upset when they feel as though the context has been destabilized. They blame the technology. What's interesting is the technologies of social media are very different than physical walls because they do have ears. And they have mouths, and they're listening, and they're recording, and they're reproducing all of the data that goes into there, often out of context. This is why we're seeing a constant state of confusion about privacy. Big data isn't arbitrary data. It's data about people's lives, data that is produced through their interactions with others, data that they don't normally see, um, let alone uh, know is being shared. And the process of sharing it and using it and publicizing it becomes a violation of privacy when it is done out of their expectations. Our obsession with big data threatens to destabilize social situations, and we need to consider what that means and make our decisions wisely. To get at this, I want to go through five points about what it means in terms of privacy. Security through obscurity is actually extremely reasonable. Not all publicly accessible data is meant to be publicized. People who share personally identifiable information aren't rejecting privacy. Aggregating and distributing data out of context is a privacy violation, and privacy is not access control. Start at the beginning. Security through obscurity, right? This thing that we've constantly dismissed as being completely terrible and something we shouldn't value. But people do many things in public spaces that are not recorded. They're often obscure. They have conversations in parks, swim in oceans, do cartwheels on the road. How they act in public spaces depends on the context. They reasonably assume that what they do in public spaces is often ephemeral. If no one's witnessing what's going on, it's not going to be recorded. Mediating technologies have been changing this offline and online. Right? Surveillance cameras record those cartwheels. Mobile phones trace where people are in parks, and cameras capture when they're swimming in oceans. People, know, people are being recorded, and when they know it, their behavior changes. When they know they're being amplified, their behavior changes. Why? Because when technologies record or amplify, they change the social situations, and people interact according to that. So when they recognize it, they make change. This is not to say that technology doesn't fade in the background. It does. People learn to live with it. But it, part of the challenge is how do they change over time? In mediated situations like Facebook, everybody knows they're being recorded. But amplifying is a little bit of a different story. The very act of these systems involves accounting for the role of technology. And people are developing skills to do that, especially younger folks. But the challenge is when we keep changing the context, even in these mediated environments, people get very confused. Because each transition has consequences. And the transitions are where problems emerge, not the actual original design. People's encounters with social systems rely on their interpretation of a context. And they've come to believe, even when their data is recorded, that they're relatively obscure. And for the most part, they are. Right? The average blog a few years ago read by Technorati was read by six people. Right? That makes you extremely obscure when you think about what aver the word average means and what you think about Boing Boing's audience must be. Right? That means the majority of blogs read by a big zero. Okay? Just because people can have things recorded doesn't mean that they get attention. At the same time, that obscurity creates new challenges when technology, especially around big data, aggregates and pulls them into sweeps in new ways. You may think that people shouldn't rely on being obscure, but asking everyone to be a paranoid sysadmin type is really unhealthy. Right? It creates a level of, of, of obsession and, care, um, and freakiness that results in a lot of psychological issues. Now, people need to understand the context in order to have their sense of boundaries. And even in public situations, people regularly go out of their way to ignore others and give them some sort of space, some sort of obscurity. The sociologist Irving Goffman refers to this as civil inattention. You may be able to stare at everyone who walks by, but you don't. And in doing so, you give people the right to maintain obscurity. What makes the internet so different? Why is it OK to demand the right to stare at everyone just because you can? Two, not all uh, publicly accessible data is meant to be publicized. People make data publicly accessible because they want others to encounter it. But they don't necessarily want all people across all space and all time to encounter it. Um, and so they have their content out there, but they're not, they think that it will be consumed by the people who, with whom it's most relevant. They don't want to lock it down because they don't want it to be inaccessible to the people that matter to them. And part of it is, is that they're using um, a sense of, of obscurity to get to context. 
Making content publicly accessible is not equal to asking for it to be distributed, aggregated, or otherwise scaled. Now, paparazzi make celebrities' lives a living hell. Consistently, the paparazzi argue that they have the right to photographs, photograph and stalk celebrities because they're in public, and they're of public interest. As a result, celebrities are often reclusive, staying at home when they, or, uh, when, when they can, or actively trying to seek rep, uh, some sort of protection when they go out into public spaces. When we argue for the right to publicize any data that is publicly accessible, we're arguing that everyone reser reserves the right to be stalked like a celebrity. Even with money and connections to actually maintain some sort of control, many celebrities go completely apeshit crazy or even die trying to navigate paparazzi. So what are the psychological consequences of turning everybody into that kind of micro-celebrity, of sicking the paparazzi on everybody who walks out into public online? People who are sharing publicly access, uh, public, uh, personally identifiable information aren't rejecting privacy. Historically, all of our conversations about privacy in the technical space have been about personally identifiable information, PII. And when we think about governments and corporations, we always go back to PII. But people regularly share their name or other identifying information with others for all sorts of legitimate reasons. They share PII when, in a social situation, they think they may get something from it. And social media has become all about social interactions. Not surprisingly, people are sharing PII all over the place. But when they share PII, that's not necessarily what they're most worried about. What they're typically worried about is PEI, personally embarrassing information. They're worried about the information that might get them into trouble. Too many people working with big data assume that when people give out PII, um, that they want their data to be aggregated and shared widely. And this isn't true, but all of a sudden we do this thing, we are able to actually aggregate across the PII and basically glum together all of the personally embarrassing information in really problematic ways. Connect to this, aggregating and distributing data out of context becomes a privacy violation. I've said it before, I'll say it again, context matters. There are two kinds of uh, content that we focus on when we think about big data. That which is explicitly shared and that which is implicitly derived. There's a beautiful parallel here to what Goffman describes um, as being given and given off. When people share something explicitly, they assess the situation and the context and they choose what to share. When they produce implicit content, they're living and breathing the social situation without necessarily even being aware of the data that they produce. But in both cases, context matters. It shapes how the data is produced and what people's expectations are. And when you take that content that was produced explicitly or implicitly out of context, you can easily misinterpret it and you often make it in a way that even the people who produced it didn't understand where it came from. This is why, and it's interesting, at some level we know this. And this is why, as companies, we keep forcing people to sign uh, terms of use that sign away their right to demand contextual integrity. It may be legal to access this data and take it out of context, but is it ethical? Is it healthy? What are the consequences? Keep in mind that privacy is not the same as access, and it's not about access control. When we talk about privacy in technical circles, we keep coming back to the questions of what can be modeled into the system. We go back to uh, numerical sequences like 700. But this collapses two things, privacy and accessibility. File permissions are about articulating who can and cannot access something. Privacy is about understanding the social conditions and working to man manage the situation. Limiting access can be one tool in the arsenal of dealing with privacy, but it's not the same as privacy. You know, in LiveJournal, I think that there's something beautiful that used to happen. It was common for participants to actually post a message and, and lock it and choose the, the actually access controls, but then go at the top and write who else could see the post and what the, why the post was locked to those particular people. It was about defining the social situation, defining the context, removed from the specific lock. Unfortunately, we keep assuming that when we see access controls that that's good enough for privacy, but it doesn't actually even begin to address the core problem, which creates a new challenge. Now, all five of these keep coming back to big ethical questions that come for big data. But, you know, just because we rupture security, should we? Just because we publicize data, should we? Just because we can leverage PII, should we? Just because we can aggregate and redistribute data, should we? Now, let me take a moment to say that while I'm giving this sort of cautionary word, the answers to these questions aren't clear. It's not a black and white picture. Because while social norms are changing, that doesn't mean that privacy has been thrown out the door. People care deeply about privacy. They care deeply about maintaining context. But they also care about the right to publicity, the right to walk out into public and to be seen, the right to use these technologies to be highly visible. 
technology has produced all sorts of new opportunities for people who want to be publicly accessible. And they give them an opportunity of creating content and get it, getting it out there. People should have the right to leverage technology to demand a presence. They should have a right to be in public. And technology that helps them scale is extremely beneficial. The problem is, is that it's algorithmically difficult to differentiate between publicly accessible data that is meant to be widely publicized and that which is simply meant to be accessible. It's hard to distinguish between content that people want to be aggregated because they'll get and gain something from it and that which was never meant for any such thing. It's hard to distinguish between PII that is shared for social purposes and that which is shared as a self-branding exercise. All of these are things we have to account for. It goes back to our methodological conundrum, right? Not all data are created equal, and it's really hard to make a reasonable assessment and reasonable interpretations from 30,000 feet without understanding the context in which data is produced and shared. Treating data arbitrarily as bytes is bound to get everybody into trouble. So we're stuck, we're stuck with this question that we all have to be part of working out. You know, and the balance is, are we going to hurt people unexpectedly? And do we err on the side of, of protecting them, or do we err on the side of helping them be public? It's a really interesting challenge. And with this in mind, let's talk about my favorite Facebook. When Facebook first launched in 2004, it started as a niche social network site that was only accessible to those privileged enough to have a harvard.edu account and eventually other.edu accounts. As it spread, it's built, it built its reputation on being a closed system. People trusted the service because they felt it provided boundaries and helped people navigate social norms. As it grew, it was interpreted by the public as the anti-MySpace. While MySpace was all about publicly accessible content, even as people were actively you know, seeking privacy, Facebook was narrated as closed, intimate, a more genuine place for friends. And I roamed about the United States interviewing teenagers. I was continuously told that Facebook was safer because it was more private. And that's why they loved the site. Now, first impressions matter. People go to great lengths to twist any new information that they may hear about, to actually reinterpret it in light of their first impression, rather than altering their first impression. And to this day, many of the average Facebook users that I talk to still believe that Facebook is about privacy. They believe that they understand how information flows on privacy, and they believe they understand the tools that allow them to control what's going on. Unfortunately, their confidence obscures the fact that most don't understand what's going on. They don't understand their privacy settings. They don't understand when data is being made out. And it's that mismatch that I think is really important to analyze. During its tenure, Facebook has made an unbelievable number of moves that have complicated people's understanding of context, resulting in numerous outpourings around frustrations of privacy. The first, the first major hiccup was the news feed. When Facebook introduced the news feed, people were initially outraged. Why? Every bit of content the newsfeed displayed was already accessible. Should have been fine, right? But the newsfeed took implicit content and publicized it as explicit content in new ways. So if you were stalking somebody, you would have noticed that they changed their, their status from being in a relationship to being single, and you might have sort of done something about it. But with the newsfeed, every single one of their friends was politely told that this change had happened. Not surprisingly, people got very upset about this. And publicizing accessible data became a game changer for people. And they got upset because it changed the context. People didn't know how to deal. They didn't know how to opt out. And their loud anger forced Facebook to create tools so that users could choose what was going on and what could be shared and not shared. This is not to say that the news feed was not a great success. It undoubtedly was. But it changed people's behaviors. And they thought differently about what content they produced on their, on their profiles. They thought very differently about the kinds of implicit data that might get produced. And interestingly, they learned actually how to manipulate the newsfeed. They learned how to work within the system and produce data for it. And those who joined after 2006 took the newsfeed for granted and developed a set of norms with that as a given. The transition was rocky, but people managed to work it out in that process, in part because not that many people were on Facebook at the time. Second hiccup, very different trajectory. This was Beacon, an advertisement system launched in 2007 that allowed external websites to post information to users' newsfeed based on their activities on external websites. Imagine that you're surfing Blockbuster and decided to rent Kill Bill. This tool would post a message to your friends on the newsfeed noting that you rented Kill Bill. Most people had no idea how this was happening, why this was happening, or what to do with it. And those who found out about it often learned the hard way. Beacon was disconcerting because it made individual people vessels for advertising to their friends. It took implicit actions on other websites and posted them. And while users could turn off Beacon, they were opted in by default, and they didn't get it, and it was not nearly as visible um, as the newsfeed. 
They only learned about it when something went wrong. In 2008, a class action lawsuit was filed against Facebook and its partners. One of the examples given during this case was a young man who purchased a diamond ring on, his web on another website, only to learn that Facebook announced his purchase and thereby wrecked his plans for a romantic proposal to his girlfriend. Beacon, uh, Beacon was dismantled last September, and Facebook settled uh, the case, um, offering a lot of money to the future of research on privacy. Shall be interesting. The third notable hiccup came last December, when Facebook decided to invite um, users to change their privacy setting. Invite is sort of a nice way of putting it. The first instantiation of the um, process asked people to consider various types of content and choose whether to make that content available to everyone or to keep their old settings. The default choice, if you saw this, was everyone at the beginning. Most users encountered this, didn't read one ounce of it, and clicked on through because they wanted to get to Facebook and it was just another pop-up. In doing so, they had no idea that this change was, be, was happening, and they made all of their content available to everyone. When Facebook was challenged by the Federal Trade Commission, Facebook proudly announced that 35% of its users had altered their privacy settings uh, when they encountered this. Because, you know, this is their proud because, of, as any researcher knows, people never change the defaults. But that means that 65% of those users made their content publicly accessible when they ran into that interface. Now, Facebook is highly incentivized to encourage people to make their data more publicly accessible. But most people wouldn't opt into a change if they understood what was happening. And as a result, Facebook's initial defaults were viewed as deceptive by regulators in Canada and Europe, something that is going to continue to plague them. Um, and I started actually looking at the pa public status updates. I was quite disturbed by what was available, which I don't think was ever meant for my eyes, let alone yours. Um, so I, I actually decided to talk to a lot of people, and I asked them to describe their privacy settings for me. And then I'd sit down with them and go through their actual privacy settings with them. Outside of the technorati and the digital privacy sort of f folks, not a single person that I interviewed had a mental map that matched their actual data settings. Right? That should be a huge alarm bell. Notably, everybody that I talked to in that category changed their settings once I asked them about it, and I wasn't even giving warning signs about what to do. Facebook has slowly dismantled the protective walls that made users trust Facebook. And going being a public site isn't inherently a bad thing. There are plenty of sites out there that are much more public um, and publicly accessible data than Facebook. But Facebook started out one way, and it has slowly changed, leaving a lot of users clueless, confused, and outright screwed. This is fundamentally how contexts get changed in ways that make people's lives very complicated. Facebook users have become the proverbial boiling frog. They jumped in when the water was cold, slowly the water keeps heating up, and some users are starting to get cooked. Just last week, Facebook introduced two new features to connect Facebook data and the publicly accessible data that occurred in December with external websites. Many of you know this. This is social plugins and instant personalizer. Unlike Beacon, the system is more about bringing publicly accessible Facebook data to third-party websites. Permission is required for the external sites to come back to Facebook. But if you go to Pandora, CNN, you might find that your friends also like the music you're listening to or have shared articles for you. You too can click like all over the web on various sites and report back to Facebook all sorts of data about what you like. And slowly but surely, data about your tastes and, and interactions across the web are being aggregated along with your profile and connected to others um, who you know. The goal is to give people a more uh, personal web experience. Perfectly reasonable goal. But users don't understand how it works, let alone how to turn it off. It relies on the changes that were very deceptive that were made in December. People don't even realize that their likes are being part of this. They don't realize that their material can leak out in any particular way. And Facebook does not make it easy to opt out entirely at all. You have to opt out to each individual partner site um, on Facebook and on the partner site. And your friends might still leak your information. Convenient. Got to love how it's going to do wonderful things to the relationships you might have. All of this is because they relied on people making their material public, and they did so through a form of trickery in December that is, that is part of why people are so confused about what's going on. Now, it's interesting. I spent six hours trying to figure out how I had managed to like various politicians. I can't figure this out. I can't figure out how to turn it off. And I've talked to all sorts of reporters who can't figure out how to turn it off in order to write about it. If we can't figure it out and we're spending hours doing it, what does that mean for average users? Healthy social interactions depend on effectively interpreting a social situation, knowing how to operate accordingly. And the part of the challenge that we see as people start to interact with these spaces is that they're trying to make sense of things. They determine a context. 
But when their data can be ripped out in ways that they don't understand, they're really hard pressed to actually figure it out. And they keep making social, people make social mistakes because they don't understand what's happening. Facebook does an amazing job of, of giving you tons of settings to control visibility, but does a terrible job of making them understandable. And so even when they inform people that a change is underway, they also opt people in rather than working to convince them that this might be useful. The opt-out norm in Facebook and on many other sites is not in the better interest of people. It's in the better interest of companies. And it's the better interest of data collectors who are doing all sorts of things with this data. Facebook could go a long way in actually helping people understand their content. When you post a status update, you get a little lock that tells you uh, which groups can see this. You could easily be told all of the individual people who could or did see this. You know, it's really interesting. I love this feature on uh, uh, Outlook exchange services, where when you're in Outlook on a corporate exchange server, and you go to write a message to an internal mailing list, a little message pops up and says, this, this message will be sent to 10,523 people. And you sit there going, yeah, I don't want to do that, right? That kind of information, that feedback is really important. It inevitably makes me think twice. Facebook doesn't want people to think twice. Facebook could also tell you all of the services that have accessed your data through APIs and the accounts have looked at any particular item of content. People surprisingly want this feature. I spent a lot of time with teenagers who installed all sorts of trackers on MySpace, which were effectively phishing scams. They didn't know this. But their reason for installing it is they really wanted to know who was looking at their profile. It's interesting. We could give this and we could make this part of the trade bargain. But the part of it is, is that if you knew all of the sites that were actually accessing your data, would you actually produce the content that you put up there? And that's one of the challenges is that people don't necessarily want you to stop producing data. Many of you are playing with Facebook's data. Others of you wish to be. The social APIs are extremely exciting and the possibilities of all of this new work is really interesting. Facebook has become one of the most fascinating sites of big data out there. It reveals people's, uh, traces of people's behavior all around the globe and provides tremendously important social network, uh, articulated social networks out there. But you're playing with fire. Much of the data that is publicly accessible was never meant for you to be chomping away at. And you don't know how to differentiate that which was intended for you and that which was not. People are engaging in Facebook for personal reasons and you're able to ex access them removed from the whole value of why they created them. It's a huge ethical question, a huge ethical challenge for how to uh, proceed in this. But keep in mind that people don't seek privacy when they have something to hide. They hide because they want to maintain a sense of privacy. They seek privacy because they're secure creatures who want to understand context to manage social situations. They want to be socially appropriate, make themselves vulnerable to those around them. They hide in plain sight, and this is getting trickier and trickier because of these new technologies. Technology creates amazing mechanisms by which we can walk out into public, engage, share, and connect. It also creates fascinating new opportunities for researchers to access data. But these advantages are not without their complications. It's easy to swing to extremes to say, this is terrible, never do this. You, of course you should do it, it's accessible. But the reality is somewhere about working these things out. Teasing out how to walk the tightrope of privacy and publicity is going to be a critical challenge of our era. As I conclude, I want to sort of take a moment to also bring Larry Lessig into this picture. A decade ago, Lessig produced a seminal book called Code, where he argued that change is regulated by four forces. The market, the law, social norms, and architecture, otherwise known as code. The changes that we're facing today about privacy and publicity are coming about because of changes in architecture, because of changes in code. It's possible to do things today that were never previously possible, and therefore technology's role as a regulator has radically changed. Because of this, we've seen all sorts of market changes, and we're seeing all sorts of things uh, playing out both in market and in, in, in code or architecture. Social norms haven't radically changed. The underlying values are still deeply there, and getting to them is absolutely core. Of course, the law is a really interesting player in all of this, and I encourage all of you to watch what's going to happen and play out, because I think that we're going to see, especially the Europeans and the Canadians, get really interested in making certain that the law aligns well with social norms. But right now, this is a point of constant confusion. As a community, WWW is the home of numerous standards bodies, big data scholars, and all sorts of developers. You have the technological and organizational chops to shape the future of code, the future of policy, and the future of the market. What you choose to build, how you choose to engage with big data actually matters. What is possible is wide open, but so are the consequences of your decisions. As you're engaging with these systems, as you're engaging with this data, I need you to remember that this data that you're chewing on is about people. 
Never forget that, uh, that big data is fundamentally soil and green. It's made out of people. And people producing data in a context, people producing data for a purpose. And just because it's technologically possible to do all sorts of things with that data, doesn't mean it won't have consequences for the people it's made of. If you expose people in ways that cause harm, you will be living with that on your conscience. Privacy will never be encoded into zeros and ones. It will always be a process, a process of context in which people are navigating. Your challenge is to develop systems and do analyses that balance the complex ways in which people are negotiating this system. You are shaping the future, and I challenge you to build the systems that you want, uh, to build the world that you want to inhabit. Thank you.